Okay, I fixed the computer, apologies. So we'll just go ahead and start this example over. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna first example of using and uh, applying the derivative uh, involving a polar curve is we want to find the tangent line to a polar curve. Uh, and our example is find the equation of the tangent line to r equals two sine of theta plus one at theta equals zero. So we know, what do we know and what do we want? Well, we see our formula for the derivative down below. And since r is 2 sine of theta plus 1, we can just directly substitute it into our formula there. The next piece of the puzzle that we need for our formula is we need to know dr d theta. Well, dr d theta is just going to be the derivative of that yellow highlighted expression, which is 2 cosine of theta, the derivative of r with respect to theta. So now we're going to go ahead and fill in this expression. So dy dx is equal to dr d theta is to cosine of theta over to cosine of theta. That's our orange expression. Now in the numerator, this is gonna be multiplied by sine of theta and in the denominator, it's multiplied by cosine of theta. Numerator plus denominator minus, we're just working our way down the, down the formula. Uh, R is two sine of theta plus one and notice you need your parentheses there. Those are definitely not option optional, especially in the denominator, uh, in both numerator and denominator, because we're going to take this expression and multiply it by cosine in the numerator and sine in the denominator, respectively. OK, now you can do a bit of algebra to tidy this up. And if you do, you will get, um, when I multiply this out, I'm going to get 2 cosine theta times sine theta, that's the same as what we have in the front uh, of the first expression in our numerator. So we're going to have a total of four cosine theta sine of theta. And then when I distribute cosine plus times positive one, I'm going to get cosine of theta. In the denominator, what are we going to get here? We're going to get two cosine squared of theta uh, minus two sine squared of theta as we distribute that. And as we continue distributing, we'll get plus uh, sine of theta. Good. So there's our derivative expression. All, and notice that we get a derivative, which is in turn, like, which means the derivative has meaning in the xy plane, slope of the tangent line to a curve at the point theta equals zero, but it's all in terms of theta. So what do we need to do next? Well, we need to, uh, find the slope. We need to evaluate this derivative when theta equals zero. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, dy dx at theta equals zero is going to be four cosine of zero, sine of zero plus cosine of zero, all over to cosine squared of zero minus, whoops, minus, minus two sine squared of, whoops, that should be a zero, not a theta. I'm having fun making thetas, uh, minus sine of zero. Okay, what about all this stuff? Well, sine of theta is zero, sine of theta is zero, sine of theta is zero, or sine of zero is zero for all of those rather. And what else, what else, what else? Cosine of zero is one and cosine of zero is one. So putting that all together in the numerator, we have zero plus one, which is one. And in the denominator, we have two times one, which is two. So our slope of the tangent line to our polar curve at theta equals zero is one half. So great, that's good. Now we know the slope of the tangent line to our curve. The next thing we need to know is what is the point on the actual curve? Well, here we have to first find our point in polar coordinates and convert that point to xy coordinates. Why? Because our slope is in terms of xy and we're gonna be plotting our line in terms of xy as well. So what do we got? We know theta equals zero. So to find the point on our polar curve, we plug theta equals zero and find the related r. So two times sine of zero plus one. Again, that becomes zero. And so this tells us that r is equal to one. So we have our polar point, r comma theta is equal to one comma zero. Now, to convert this to rectangular coordinates, we'll look at what it looks like. And in polar coordinates, this has a radius of one 
at an angle of zero, so it's on that positive polar axis. If we were to convert this to x, y, if this were some different point, like over here, we'd have to do a bit more work. But since it's on the x-axis, like and it's a nice point like that, the actual conversion is fairly straightforward. These are the points that share the same coordinates in polar as x, y. OK, and now we're ready to find the equation of the tangent line. What is the equation of a line? Well, in general, it's going to be y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. And I'm going to go ahead and write y1 and x1 in blue to emphasize that those that point can't be the polar point, but rather needs to be the equivalent version of the polar point in the xy coordinate system. So we're going to have y minus 0 is equal to our slope we calculated on the prior slide is 1 half times x minus 1. And again, I'm emphasizing that those are that xy version. Algebra that into shape, and we see that y is equal to 1 half x minus 1 half. So now let's put this all together. So there's our polar curve, y is equal to 2 sine of theta plus 1. And our point, 1 comma theta, when theta equals 0 is right there. And we can see that if we were to plot that line in terms of x, y coordinates, we would have a nice tangent line. Let's go ahead and visit the graph of this to kind of confirm and, and really, really illustrate this point. All right, so now we see things plotted in polar coordinates here. Maybe I'll make it bold easier to see. Let's switch this to Cartesian coordinates so that we can think about uh, our line in rectangular or Cartesian coordinates. Sure enough, uh, we wouldn't want to plot our polar curve in rectangular coordinates, but our line is going to be a heck of a lot easier to plot in rectangular coordinates too. We see that our slope is in fact rise one and run two. Uh, y is equal to one half x plus one. Okay. Back to our slides. So that was our uh, example of derivatives of polar curves. Next, we will continue to look at integration. Now, when we were doing integration in rectangular coordinates, we split up the area under a curve into rectangles. And as we changed the step size with respect to x, delta x, uh, and then we took the limit and let delta x go to infinity, or uh, that's wrong. That's absolutely a typo. That's the number of steps we let to go to infinity. What we let delta x go to was we let delta x go to zero, not theta zero. And as that step size goes to zero, what did we get? We got infinitely thin rectangles that were so thin they were basically just lines. And when we added them all up, we got the exact area under the curve. Now with polar coordinates, the idea is similar, but just a little bit different. Instead of looking at area under a curve, we're going to look at the area enclosed by a curve. And we're going to divide that area up into sectors of a circle, which are those little triangles that we see down there. So this time, instead of changing our step size with respect to x, we're changing our step size with respect to theta. And we want delta theta to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So we'll let our step size for the size of our sectors to be zero. And at that point, they're no longer these little triangular slices, but they are so thin, they are just little bitty lines that as we sum them all up in integration, because remember, an integral is just an infinite sum, we're going to get the exact area not under the curve, but rather enclosed in the curve as we let theta vary. So let's see how this works in an example. Well, our first example is we're going to show you how to use this to calculate the area enclosed by a polar curve. Again, our polar curves are always going to be of the form r is equal to f of theta. You can isolate theta. One more fact we need is we need to know the area of a sector of a circle. And that formula is given by the area of a sector of a circle is 1 half theta r squared. What that means is if you have some kind of a curve and you're interested in uh, Let's see, let's do it this way, this little sector. Well, that angle there that I drew, it's, I'm not, don't have room to put theta in there, but that would be your theta. And this distance here to the edge of the curve would be our radius 
and that'll give you the area of that little triangle or sector of that circle. So if we apply that to our an integral situation, we can let the theta vary from a alpha to beta. And then when we take the area, uh, the, the integral of our area calculation, however, instead of theta being just theta directly, that theta becomes our step size of delta theta there. So, all right. And if you want to, you can pop that one half to the outside. Let's see an example of this. So let's find the area enclosed by this cardioid r is equal to 2 plus 2 cosine of theta. Now I'm telling you it takes from 0 to 2 pi to generate this entire cardioid. And you can go through the process of graphing it if you want. But I encourage you to make use of Desmos to help you determine the range that angle theta needs to vary so that you get one trace out of your curve only. So got a couple of blank slides here for our actual area calculation. Well, we know the area calculation is area is equal to, well, we know that to generate our cardioid, we need to let theta vary from zero to two pi. And the area integral is one half r squared d theta. So what is r squared? Well, r is two cosine theta. So we're gonna go ahead and put that into our integral. We're gonna get integral from zero to two pi, one half times two plus two cosine of theta squared d theta. Now don't go ahead and factor out that two yet because we have to deal with our exponent square first. I'm gonna drop the limits of integration, but we'll come back for them later. One half times parenthesis, two times two is four plus four cosine theta plus four cosine theta gives us eight cosine theta uh, plus two times two is four cosine squared of theta d theta. Now I can factor out a two to get integral one half times two, uh, two plus four cosine of theta plus two cosine squared of theta d theta. Now those twos reduce away and my integral tidies up a bit. Well, we're nearly ready to integrate, but we have that pesky uh, cosine squared to deal with. So we'll do that with that as usual by an application of our half angle formulas. Uh, so cosine squared becomes one half plus one half cosine of, remember to double the input there, cosine of two theta d theta. So if we factored out that half, we would see that those would reduce away. And what we would be left with is this expression. We would get integral of two plus four cosine of theta plus one plus cosine of two theta d theta. Now I can combine those like terms there of the constants to get integral three plus four cosine of theta plus cosine of twice theta d theta. Integrating this with respect to theta, I get three theta plus derivative of uh, what has the derivative of four cosine theta? Well, four sine of theta has the derivative of four cosine theta. And what has the derivative of cosine of two theta? Well, plus one half sine of two theta has that derivative. And a quick u substitution will show us that. Now, limits of integration. While we drop them, don't forget them. We're evaluating this thing from theta is equal to zero to theta is equal to two pi. All right, plugging that in, we get three times two pi plus four times sine of two pi plus one half sine of two times two pi gives me four pi minus big parenthesis, uh, three times zero is zero, sine of zero is zero, sine of zero is zero, bunch of zeros there. Careful with that, I'm being relatively quick, but as we've discussed before, you always wanna be real careful when you're evaluating something for zero. All right, what else happens? Well, these terms, sine of two pi and sine of four pi respectively are also zero. And we see that we're left with the area enclosed with our cardio to six times or three times two pi to give us our conclusion of six pi. Nice.
Uh, we had another second blank slide, which we didn't need. So we'll move on to the next example. Let's use this area formula to derive the formula for the area of a circle of radius r. But first, we'll do it with the unit circle. With the unit circle, have the formula r is equal to 1. So our area integral, we know that to generate the unit circle, we have to let theta vary from 0 to 2 pi times our area integral, 1 half times radius squared d theta. Well, radius squared is 1 squared d theta. So that is just the integral of 1 half d theta. Integrating 1 half with respect to theta, we get 1 half theta evaluated from theta equals 0 to theta equals twice pi. Evaluate that, we're going to get 1 half times 2 pi minus 0, which is going to give us pi. Now note, we know that the formula for the general formula for area of a circle is pi r squared. And if we plug in 1 for our radius, we sure enough come to the same conclusion. Well, now let's try and do that for a circle of radius r. OK, so what is our area integral in this case? It would again be from 0 to 2 pi. That will generate a circle exactly once. And of radius r, it's 1 half r squared. Well, what is r squared? Well, be a little careful here. We assume that we can write this in terms of r of r is equal to f of theta. Now, here, r is equal to just a constant number, r, a fixed number. So that's going to be what we're going to put in for r squared. We're going to have r squared here, d theta. Now, r squared is just a constant. So when we integrate this, we're going to get 1 half r squared theta and evaluate that rig from theta equals 0 to theta equals twice pi. Do that math, and you'll see that we get 1 half times 2 pi squared is going to give us uh, 1 half times 4 pi squared, which is going to be, wait a minute, I've done something wrong here. Yes. OK, and sometimes when you make a mistake, it's best to pause and slow down and say, what did you do? Oh, yeah, I totally I put theta in for r, squared it, and dropped the theta. Not how we do it. Let's fix that. OK, this is equal to 1 half r squared. Remember, r is a constant. And I even wrote theta equals 0 and pi, 2 pi to emphasize that you're plugging in for theta, not r, minus 1 half r squared times 0. Well, that whole expression is 0. So now we see that the twos reduce away, and we're left with pi r squared as we should get. Apologies for that little hiccup. What else can we do with integration? Well, instead of just calculating the area uh, inside one curve, we can calculate the region bounded or between two polar curves and all kinds of different setups. And the way we do this is we take the area of the bigger, we calculate a bigger area, and then we subtract away the smaller area that we don't want. So you got your area integral is 1 half r squared with respect to your bigger area, and then 1 half r squared uh, with respect to your smaller area, you subtract that away. So let's do an example here. Let's find the area inside the unit circle, but outside the cardioid. And so the unit circle is shown below in blue, r is equal to 1, and the cardioid is shown below in red as r is equal to 1 minus cosine of theta. Now, um, let's just looking at this graph, we got to figure out what, ang what area do we want? Well, first and foremost, we want this area. We want the area inside the unit circle, but outside the cardioid. Sorry, my marker is a little bit thicker than it needs to be, but that should relatively well communicate the area that we're after. We want that part in the unit circle, but outside the cardioid. So if we let, whoops, sorry about that. If we let theta vary, it looks like from negative pi over 2 here to pi over 2. That should give us everything in the what we think of as rectangle coordinates quadrant 1 and 4. And as we let that vary, we're going to be calculating these sector areas. And so the bigger area is going to be my blue area. And to that, I want to subtract away this little inner area, the area for the sector that is uh, between negative pi over 2 and 2 pi. Now, you can always use, and probably should, use a 
graph to confirm that these limits of integration are correct. Sometimes you can do the algebra too as well. So if we wanted to do the algebra before we visited the graph, I would take R and set it equal to R. And this, this approach isn't always perfect. When, as we know, when you do some of this trigonometry stuff, you end up with more than one answer. So one minus cosine of theta is equal to one. Move the cosine to the right. So we have it, well, no, I'll just move the one over from the left to the right to get negative cosine of theta is equal to zero, then multiply by negative one or divide by negative one, whatever you want to do. That's the same thing as cosine is equal of theta is equal to zero. And when is cosine zero? Well, cosine is zero exactly when you're at pi over two and negative pi over two, but also three pi over two and seven pi over two and all kinds of other angles. So which ones do we want? Use the graph to confirm that sure enough, between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, we get exactly the regions we want only once. So firing up that graph. Let's uh, make this a little bit thicker here. Okay, so now I've got this field, this selected field here. Sorry about the keyboard popping up and down, ranging from negative A to A. And if we look below that, we see A is equal to pi over pi times B over 12. So as I drag this B slider, it's gonna rotate, it's gonna go by steps of 12 in both the positive and negative direction from theta equals zero. So we see that theta equals zero is at the pinpoint of that heart, and we'd expect that. And then as we go out to six pi over 12, six times b pi in a, above the field above, we get pi over two in the positive and negative direction. We see that, yeah, that gives us exactly that. Now, if we were to just do the uh, area calculation for the cardioid, we would get this region here. We would get this region just like that and this region just like that because as you fan out, you're gonna be adding up infinitely thin sectors, kind of like that. So if we take those away from the larger half of the, uh, if we did just the unit circle from those same thing, we would ju just that half circle. And if we take away that red part, we'll be left with exactly what we want. So I'll clear these drawings and get back to our slides. Okay. So now we're ready to do this thing. So the area of our big area, what is that? Well, that's gonna be the half of our unit circle. We wanna calculate that area. That's going to be from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, um, one half radius squared, one half r squared. Well, the radius of this is just the unit circle. So it's one squared d theta. And as we do that, we get one half theta as the result of that integral. And then we're gonna evaluate that for theta equals negative two pi over two to pi over two positive. And we get one half times pi over two minus one half times negative pi over two it gives us pi over four plus negative times negative is positive, pi over four. Two pi over four reduces to pi over Two. So that is the area of half of our unit circle. That's this area. Now, what do we want? We want to take away the area of that cardioid, these two bits. And so we could calculate both of those areas, but instead we could also get clever because I like evaluating things at zero instead of pi over two and other angles. So I'm going to use symmetry and I'm just going to calculate the top half and I'm going to double that amount. So the area of my smaller bit, the bit I want to subtract away is going to be twice the area highlighted in orange, which goes angle goes from zero to pi over two. Now one half radius squared in this case becomes the formula R is equal to one cosine of theta is what our cardioid is. And so we do one half times R squared becomes one minus cosine of theta quantity squared d theta. 
Now, as we saw last time, we're going to need to multiply that out, and then we're going to get a cosine squared expression, which we're once again going to have to use our reducing, our reduction trig formulas, half angle formulas, or double angle formulas, whatever you want to call them, and take that rig down to a single power. All right, there's a bit of this. And again, I'm, I'm going to leave some of these steps out in the interest of doing more examples uh, rather than just doing a few and working out every little step. OK, so if we do that math, we or this integral, we get 3 over 2 theta uh, minus 2 sine of theta plus 1 quarter sine of 2 theta. And we're going to evaluate that from theta equals to 0 to pi over two. And that this result takes into account that two that's highlighted outside. We've, we've accounted for that. And that's what we get. Now, plugging in those theta values and evaluating that expression, we end up with um, negative three pi over four minus two. And adding that stuff together, we end up with positive three pi minus eight over four. I can't really tell. Uh, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be there. And for that, I apologize. All right, so what happens now? Well, the area of our circle was the big area, and that is our pi over two. And from that, we want to take away the small area, the area inside of the cardioid. And when you do that, you get negative pi plus eight over four, which is approximately 1.5. 2146. Now, notice that we could also use the same graph to set up a variety of other interesting integrals to find areas of uh, enclosed regions. We could pop backwards here and we could say, all right, maybe I want to find this. Uh, whoops, let's get a different highlighter. Maybe I want to find this region. I need to find the area inside the, the, the half of the cardioid that's in the second and third quadrants. And from that, I need to subtract the area in the unit circle in the second and third quadrants. Uh, or we could do half of that area. We could just find this rig right here, other things like that as well. Okay, another example. Uh, this time our, our curves are given by r is equal to two plus two sine of theta. That's given in blue below and in orange, we've got r is equal to six sine of theta. When we look at these, it's a little less obvious um, what the angles of integration are going to be. And so we might need to do a little bit of algebra or use some technology to help us figure that out. So before we fire up the uh, calculator, let's go ahead and see if we can work this out uh, using some algebra. Well, setting r equal to r, we would set 2 plus 2 sine of theta is equal to 6 sine of theta. And when we solve that, we work our way down and get sine is equal to one half. Well, where is sine equal to one half? Whoops, it's supposed to be a marker, not a, pen, a highlighter. There we go. Well, this means what? We got our reference triangles here and sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So we'd have an opposite of one over two. We'd get positive values of sine there and negative values of sine in those quadrants respectively. Now we're after positive one half. And so that happens here and here. And from our knowledge of the key angles uh, and sine and cosine evaluated at those key trig angles, this happens at pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6, which if I look back at my graph, seems like a pretty good idea. So let's just verify this with a uh, graph. And sure enough, highlight, let's see if we make that bigger. There we go. So the highlighted section in black, and the fact that if you look at the black field on the left, it looks like I made a typo. I put pi of five as the lower limit of integration. It should be pi over six, but if it were pi over six, that that uh, part of the black that doesn't quite hit the blue on the first quadrant would connect to the blue and show us that, sure enough, these two intersect at pi over six and five pi over six. Back to our slides. Now it's time to calculate this integral. So let's do it. So our air, our setup is going to be the area uh, that we want, the trapped region is going to be the area of 
that is trapped by our circle minus the area minus the area that's trapped by our cardioid. We could get cutesy and write that as area of heart, but I've already done it, so we'll leave it that way. Okay, so what are we gonna get when we write this out? Uh, okay, so this is going to be integral from pi over six to five pi over six of the area of our circle, that's one half, times r squared for our circle, it's gonna be six sine of theta quantity squared. That is the area of the circle that we want. We wanna subtract away the area of this cardioid. That's one half r squared again, and this time r squared, it's gonna be two plus two cosine of, oh, sine of theta, sorry, my hand was in the way. We wanna subtract away the area of the cardioid given by that expression, and then do that integral. Now this isn't uh, an easy integral, but it's nothing we can't handle. There's gonna be quite a bit of algebra there. We're gonna use some more of those uh, power reducing trig formulas. Uh, and what we're gonna see is that if we do that math, we will come out with a nice clean four pi as our region. And uh, let's check out this graph real quick. Looks like I accidentally tapped it more than once. There we go. There we go. There's another graph to take a look at. That doesn't really confirm too much. All right. Let's keep going. This time we want to find the area enclosed by a three petal rose, the entire area enclosed there. What we're going to do for this is we're going to be clever. Instead of finding the entire area or trying to find the entire area, we're going to use a little bit of symmetry and we're going to calculate half of the leaf that the part of the leaf that's in the first quadrant. Uh, and so since uh, how how if you plug in two pi over three uh, into theta up here, your theories are going to reduce way and you're going to get two pi. So this thing has a period of two pi over three will generate letting theta range from zero to two pi over three will generate the entire uh, rose curve. And so finding our limits of integration, we can fire up Desmos and see that from zero to pi over six will give us just the part of the curve that we want. So you can see there that the second field down R is less than or equal to cosine of three theta letting zero range from zero to pi over six give us, us exactly what we want, that, that half of a petal, which we can then use a little bit of clever algebra, multiplying it by, oh, I don't know, there's six pieces there, you know? We got annotate this rig. We got one, two, uh, these would all be split in half, three, four, five, and six pieces. So you just take that result, multiply it by six or multiply it by two to get one leaf and then multiply by that by three, either way you slice it, you're gonna come up with the same result. Back to our slides. Okay. So our area formula, one half r squared becomes one half cosine squared of three theta d theta in this case. And now cosine squared of three theta becomes one half plus one half cosine of six theta, which I chose to write together as one fraction. Now, also a little bit of caution here. Remember, when you apply this formula, you double the input. And so three theta becomes two times three theta, which is six theta. Why did I write it as one fraction? Well, because writing it one fraction allows me to factor out both of those, which will give me one fourth, which I can pull straight out of the integral and get a somewhat easier to look at integral. Uh, evaluating the integral of one plus cosine of six theta d theta, with respect to theta, we get one fourth times the quantity theta plus one sixth sine of six theta. And we're gonna evaluate that from theta equals zero to pi over six. Doing that will give us that the area of one half petal, again, area of one half petal here, whoops. I don't know what I, what's happened when we use this color. Half of a petal is pi over four. We can then double that 
to get the area of one single full petal as pi over 12. And finally, what we want in green is the area of the entire enclosed entirely by the rows. Since it has three petals, we take three times the area of one petal to get pi over four, which is about 0.79. So there's another example there. Just to kind of put it in reference, I plotted the uh, rows curve, but instead of using the polar grid, I used the rectangular grid. And just to show that our answer of about 0.79 sort of makes sense. You can imagine if those uh, petals were movable and you picked them up and all stacked them all in this uh, first grid, which has area of one, it wouldn't quite fill it. It would maybe fill about three quarters of that grid. So our, our answer of pi over four, about 0.79, kind of makes sense. Okay, our last application of integration uh, polar curves is to find arc length. And just as a warning, whoops, I think I went too many slides. There we go, yep. The equation for arc length in polar coordinates is length is given by the integral, letting theta vary from alpha to beta of the square root of f theta, f of theta squared. So unchanged original function, r squared, we see, r squared. And then the derivative, add to that the derivative squared. Um, f prime to theta is dr d theta squared. And again, I can tend to like the notation on the right a little bit better because I think it, it uh, matches more how we're presented with equations. We typically don't write them as f of theta equals a bunch of theta stuff. We usually write r equals a bunch of theta stuff. Now, two notes real quick with respect to this last concept is you want to make sure that your limits of integration, alpha to beta, only trace out the curve exactly once. You don't want to trace the curve more than one time or you're going to get the arc length of two times around the curve, for example. Um, and additionally, we do need that f of theta, f prime of theta, the derivative is continuous on that theta interval as well. Okay, so we looked earlier at the area enclosed by this cardioid. So as a reminder, we could graph this thing real quick and it looks like this. It crosses the vertical axis at two and negative two, and then over here on the horizontal axis at four, and it's kind of a heart. I'm not very good at drawing polar curves, as you'll kind of observe, but that's sort of what our cardioid looks like here. So since r is two plus two cosine of theta, when we do r squared our formula, we just square the unchanged two plus two cosine of theta. Now, the derivative with respect of r with respect to theta is the derivative of this yellow highlighted expression. And that's going to be derivative of two is zero, derivative of two cosine of theta is negative sine of theta, as we see down there. And to finish this things out, yeah, I'm going to leave this to say, check out the OpenStax text. They worked this one as an example in its entirety, showing all the steps on the way. Oftentimes, these arc length calculations can be pretty tricky, and I'll show you why on the next slide, where we'll look at another one. So we could also do the arc length of r is equal to 1 minus cosine of theta. And again, our formula is equal to let it vary from 0 to 2 pi generates this curve exactly once. And so under the square root, we'll use r squared. Well, that's unchanged, 1 minus cosine, the quantity squared, and then dr d theta squared, and that would be the derivative of r. Well, the derivative of 1 is 0, and the derivative of negative cosine is negative negative sine, which is positive sine. So we have sine squared underneath there. We would multiply that jazz out, and we would say, hey, this is pretty cool. I like it when I see cosine squared plus sine squared, because that becomes a 1. And I put together this one and this one to get 2 minus 2 cosine of theta underneath my square root. Now. Here's where things get a little bit tricky. We have to apply, I don't know if it's a relatively obscure, but it's not one I know off the top of my head. This trig identity, one minus cosine of theta is equal to two times sine squared of theta over two. Now what we do here is underneath that root, we factor out two uh, and we get two times quantity one minus cosine of theta. And then that one minus cosine of theta there, this becomes, this, and so we get a two factor that is multiplied by this two factor to get four times sine squared of theta over two. Now that's under a square root 
and we can pop that out because it's a bunch of squared quantities, four squared, uh, the square root of four is two and the square root of sine squared over of theta over two is equal to sine of theta over two. So what is what has derivative two sine of theta over two? Well, quick u substitution, and we'll see that we get negative four cosine of theta over two. Evaluating that from zero to two pi, we get a very very nice result of eight. And it's kind of interesting that these these polar curves have very very nice um, integer whole number uh, arc lengths sometimes. But yeah, sometimes these arc length calculations can be pretty challenging. I have checked your Homeworks I've assigned have been doable though with things we have seen without being too like a, a pulling out on too many of these obscure or not so readily uh, handy trig identities or things. So as a last example of arc length and polar coordinates, let's derive the formula for the circumference of a circle. Well, since we're after circumference, I'm gonna say C instead of L, C is equal to, well, the circumference of a radius circle R. Well, a circle is going to be generated by letting theta vary from 0 to 2 pi. And our formula is R squared. So that's just going to be R squared. And then what's the derivative of dr d theta? Well, R is just R equals to R. You know, R is equal to R, as we saw before. And so the derivative of R with respect to theta is 0 d theta. So what we really have is just R squared underneath the square root. And so we'll pop that R out. It's a nice positive value. And we get the derivative, I'm sorry, we get the integral from zero to two pi of R d theta. Now R is a constant. So when we integrate this, we get R times theta evaluated from theta equals zero to theta equals two pi. And by writing theta, it reminds me what variable I'm plugging in for. It reminds me that R is a constant. So R times two pi minus R times zero gives us two pi R. And we've got our familiar equation for the circumference of a circle of radius r is equal to 2 pi r. And that brings this, uh, our discussion of calculus involving polar curves and polar coordinates to an end.